Welcome to this week's Shannon's Lifestyle. And today, our guest is Daniel Longer. Thank you so much for being here, Daniel. Yeah, thank you so much for having it's me. It's our honor because Daniel Longer is the CEO of the luxury, lifestyle, and consumer brand strategy firm, Equity. And he has consulted some of the leading luxury brands such as Ferrari, Maserati, um, KitchenAid, Nesto, just to name a few in the world. And he is also the author of several luxury management books, a regular keynote speaker, and hosts management sem seminars in Europe, USA, and Asia, all over the world. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. I know it was like a hard trip that making back and forth. <laughs> yeah. But yeah th you really thank you very much for having me. Yeah. This yeah. is great. So, Daniel, so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about your forecast um, on the luxury market in 2020. Yeah, so um, my estimate is going to be that uh, the luxury market is continuing to grow. So obviously it's always a little bit uh, difficult to predict how the development will be within a year. Because as you know, no one knows right, exactly right now how is the trade war going, is, will there be a recession or not. And there can be always influencing factors. But if I look long term, so let's take the last 10-15 years. Luxury markets have always been outpacing the non-luxury markets, so always been more successful. And I predict that this, con this trend is going to continue over the next couple of years. So despite even the economy, how the economy is going to turn out? Yeah, and actually what was very interesting, so my personal journey with luxury started in 2008. In 2008, I finished my PhD thesis on, on the topic. And uh, it was obviously a very interesting year because we were in the middle of the big recession. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that when I finished my thesis, people were telling me, oh, fantastic, you just finished and the luxury market is going to be dead forever because no one will ever buy luxury products. And then when we look back now uh, from 2019 to 2008, it's actually quite interesting what happened. So first of all, if we take 2008, so 2008 in the big recession, all markets were down but luxury was just flat, was zero. So this means people were still buying more luxury products than any other products. And then in the subsequent years after 2008, immediately the market was uh, uh, swinging back. And since then we have growth rates depending on the category between five and 10%. And then also depending on the region. So for example, if you think about the more maybe mature markets, North America and Europe, the growth in luxury has been always about four to 6%. Mm -hmm. But if you look at China, for example, even last year when so many people were saying that the boom of the Chinese market is over, the market was growing 20% in luxury. So and I would say 20% is not recession. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you have consulted for a lot of global markets mm -hmm. in the world, um, everywhere. So what is your thought on the differences between US markets and the Asia markets in the luxury? Yeah. There's quite a lot of differences and I would say um, if I look at my consulting work um, the ability to bridge these differences is maybe one of the most crucial uh, factors for success. So um, let's start for maybe with a typical Western luxury consumer and this can be in North America or can be in Europe. And then obviously it depends always a little bit on the category. So some categories are a bit more mature and other categories less. But I would say the typical luxury consumers, consumer maybe in US and Europe is 45 year old, years old, maybe 50 years old, in some cases 60 years and elder. And most brands that I talk with when I speak about their customers, they will tell me, oh, this is, for example, I don't know, a lady in her mid 50s and she will buy the products. And um, when I ask them, how digital are those consumers? Then they will say most decisions will be taken in the store. They maybe are digital, but because of their age, maybe they're not as digital. So if we now go to China, we see a dramatically different picture. So China is by far the youngest luxury market. So therefore also I, I like to say, sometimes China is a little bit like a periscope into the future because what, what happens now in China will happen in the rest of the world uh, subsequently. So you think it's like a forecast for the rest of the luxury market? Yeah, in a sense, yes. And I give you uh, the reason. So um, if we take now what I just said in the Western markets, um, average age maybe 45 to 55 as the sweet spot for luxury. Mm -hmm. In China, do you know how old it is? I, I would think maybe around 20 something to to 40? Yeah, and it's actually very correct. So it's between 20 and 30 is really the sweet spot of the market. 20 to 30? Yeah. And I was, yeah, I went a little bit older than that. Yeah. yeah. And now there's something very interesting about it's really this. Young. Um, usually when you have uh, consumers in this age bracket, let's say 20 to uh, 30, 
there's one thing that they particularly don't like to do. They usually do, don't like to do the same things that their parents are doing. So this means a 20-year-old woman usually will not buy the same products than her mother, and a 20-year-old man will also not buy the same things that, that the father is buying. Right. So this means for brands now, if they still think in marketing to people that are around 30 or 40, they will never reach the young consumers. So actually what they have to do, and I was writing a lot recently about this, in order to get this 20-year-old, you have to market to the 16-year-old. And this requires a complete different mindset because if in principle now you are selling all the time in your mindset to the 45-year-old, 55 years or 65-year-old person, maybe let's say in a city in the middle of Europe or in the middle of US, which is completely different as you know from Shanghai and Beijing, now you have to completely uh, switch mindset and say, okay, how do I sell to a 16-year-old girl in um, Guangzhou or Shanghai. And this is very, very different to, um, to selling someone, I would say, in the Midwest uh, in their mid-40s. And actually it makes complete sense because kids are the future. Mm. I mean, after a few years, they will mm. become older and they will be the one who will actually lead the world. Mm. So do you think in marketing, we always have to think one step ahead? Yeah, we have to think one step ahead. And I would say one of the biggest mistakes that companies are doing is to underestimate the purchasing power of the young consumers. Um, this is, I would say, really what maybe, I don't want to say the number one mistake, but one of the cardinal mistakes that I see. So very often when I speak with brands, they tell me, ah, you know, those consumers below 40, yeah, I, we, one day we have to target them, but uh, they don't have the money. Yeah. So then I always like to look more to numbers than to gut feeling. And if you look at the numbers, it's completely different. So uh, the generation that is called the millennials, so people between 20 and 40 roughly now, they are already worldwide the number one luxury spenders So in, all over the world. But the if, if we go to China now, so in the world we can say millennials are roughly 40 to 45 percent of all luxury spendings worldwide are between 20 and 40. So it's quite significant. But now when we go to China, how much do you think is the, is the percentage of millennials? I think millennial is definitely up and coming. Yeah. So it's remarkable. It's more than 70% of the spendings are from, from people 20 to 40. And actually, is it just in Asia or is it like all around the globe? I mean, is, of course, it's so going to be the presenting the future. Exactly. The tendency is all around the globe, but the more extreme in, most extreme in China. Uh, Korea and Japan are, are also, well, Japan also is a little bit elder overall in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the way how they age, the age basic parameter is structured. But in principle, uh, China is the youngest luxury market, at least of the, of the large markets. And I would say overall, there is a tendency towards younger consumers in Asia than in other, in other uh, regions. Yeah, um, what I noticed also is I think Asian people t tend to have a little bit more, like, more expensive taste in, mm. the, in the brands. I mean, do you think there's something to do with the culture? Yeah, there's definitely a, there's definitely a cultural aspect, um, but let me take a step back. I would say because I'm asked this question very often is is there really a difference in terms of luxury all over the world? Are there countries that are more luxury countries than other? And my experience is that in the principle of luxury is the same all over the world. Yeah, the the reason why people buy luxury is the same all over the world, but what is very different are expressions. And this is for me always striking when I travel, for example. So, um, and one of my favorite things is just to watch people when I'm at the airport, may maybe wait waiting in the security line, right. just looking how people in front of me are dressed. Mm. And so when I'm, for example, in Shanghai or when I'm in Hong Kong, I see people, I don't know, wearing, let's say, Gucci from head to toe. Everything is about logos. Everything is always about the latest uh, collection um, that you have to have. So there's a lot of, I would say, social savviness on what is really going on right now in this moment. And if you have the wrong sneaker, then you're not seen as, uh, as cool enough yeah, and, and savvy cool enough, from, yeah. from, your, from your friends. So now then, for example, recently I had to fly from Shanghai to, um, to Korea. So I was uh, um, leaving Shanghai and landed a couple of hours later in Seoul. So now I'm in Seoul airport. Also, everyone was dressed in a very sophisticated way, but you didn't see logos. So everything was much more muted, more reserved. Um, maybe a little bit more reserved, less loud, so to mm -hmm. speak, maybe less, less expressive. Mm -hmm. But you could still see it's probably the same level of luxury, luxuriousness than in other places. Another thing that I find striking, for example, is when I'm in Hong Kong um, and observing people 
which kind of watches they're they're wearing. And while I would say in most uh, parts of the world, people will be rather conservative with the watches. You will not show usually too much gold and uh, too much kind of over the top. In um, in Hong Kong, I'm, all the time I'm amazed. Uh, what you also you see. see the big commercials everywhere too. As you see well. the big commercials, yeah. but you see f uh, 300, 400,000 dollar watches uh, regularly. If I'm in the restaurant, the server will have a 20,000 dollar watch. And wow. uh, these are things that you don't see so much in other places in, in the world. And I noticed in the Western world, sometimes in America, mm. um, a lot of um, Americans are very interested in having luxury experience mm. instead of more like flashing off a name brand. Is mm. that also part of considered as luxury too? Yeah, experiences actually are really shaping now the luxury market. And I would say um, maybe in the past, maybe still in the Western world, people would be more t uh, with the tendency towards experiences because maybe in, um, I don't know, countries like China or so, when the economic situation was not yet as robust as it is right now, maybe people were just r kind of getting into the market and first going for products first and then satisfying the, the, the wish to have maybe an expensive handbag or an expensive car. And then once they have this, then they move on to experiences. But what we see now is that Asia really becomes an experience um, um, community, an experience place. And I would say China is leading. And this is sometimes very interesting thing. So I know a case, for example, of a person and she earns about maybe, let's say, two to three thousand dollars a month. So um, this, this kind of income bracket. And then she wants to spend a couple of days in Paris. And then she asked someone um, for advice where to stay, and she said the budget is three thousand dollars. And th the person thought, oh, three thousand dollars must be for um, for a week or for the three or four days you want to travel. She said, no, 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 no. I want to really have a fantastic experience. So I'm willing to spend three thousand dollars per day, and I want to have the best hotel I can get so that I will never forget this uh, this experience. Mm -hmm. And when I heard about the story, I thought I never ha heard something like that maybe in a Western context. Most people would rather say, okay, I take now my budget, how can I maximize the days? Yeah, how can I maybe stay for two weeks and maybe see some, see some other things? And for her, it was much more... About experience and enjoy exactly. the moment. And yeah. how can I do something and get something that I could maybe never ever get in my life again? So it was much more, um, maybe it's much more personal. And for her, the days didn't matter so much. So, and um, one, of the, one of the things when uh, she talked to her friend, was about, um, yeah, you know, actually I'm willing to, to stay, sp uh, stay one day less, but if the hotel experience is really so much better. Which actually makes sense to me, because if you think about it, you know, people are willing to pay things that you probably will never get anywhere else. Mm. It's like the omelet example that you actually mentioned earlier. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually quite, uh, quite yeah, funny maybe, maybe, example. Yeah, maybe you can talk a little <laughs> bit about <laughs> exactly. on the, on the omelet. Exactly. It's actually th this famous omelet is my, one of my favorite examples. So, you know, I told you that I um, did a PhD on luxury management. And in my research, one of the things that I wanted to figure out is what is the right price for a product? Yeah. Because the setting of the price is one of the most difficult things, especially in luxury. Um, you know, when you when you build like a mass market brand, a brand where you spend, I don't know, or where you sell like millions and millions of products, there are certain market research tools where you can kind of try to get an idea of the pricing. But when it comes to luxury, this breaks down because there's not so many people that will be able to buy certain things at the absolute top end of a category. And so if we now speak about, and with the absolute top end, I mean maybe the top really zero zero one percent of okay. of the of the market so and if i don't have a lot of people there because uh, um, you know not a lot of people can afford and there's not a lot of products that are at the absolute top end then market research becomes pretty difficult so the question is now how do you price a product and then came this omelet so and uh, so this is an omelet that is sold in new york at uh, one of the hotels of the at the parker le meridian and it's called the zillion dollar frittata and I was, I was comparing all kind of different categories. Uh, I took looked uh, at airlines, airline tickets, at cars, at, um, I don't know, champagne, wines, you name it. Uh, I think about 100 categories. And um, I don't know, one of the categories that f came to my mind was omelets. Because I, and I don't know why, I have, uh, no clue. Maybe I was eating an omelet on that day or something. And then I said, okay, just want let, let me find out what is the most expensive omelet. So I m made some research and I find this omelet in New York. Thousand dollars, and that's thousand say, dollar for an omelet. Thousand yeah. dollars. How epic! Yeah, mm -hmm. and this was like ten, maybe ten years ago, and I was thinking as a student, I found this completely absurd. 
I thought no one ever is going to buy an omelette for thousand dollars. So then I remember I called the hotel and I asked them, is actually someone buying this omelette? And they told me, yeah, yeah, there's a couple of people every week that comes and, and buys this. Okay, so I knew it's not just a fantasy product and fantasy price, but people actually are paying for this. And then I thought this now gets interesting. So let's actually see, is this omelette, is it really too expensive or is it maybe too cheap? Because this is now the interesting thing about pricing. You can always do it, make it wrong in two directions. And in luxury now it's very fatal because if your pricing is too low, and you're not selling so many units, then obviously your profitability will not be very, right. will be not very, very good. So, um, so we did some calculations. Um, I developed like a pricing model for luxury, and then I figured out this omelette could be easily two times the price. So I was, I was, uh, my my calculations kind of revealed about two or three thousand dollars should be the right price for this omelette. And I remember because they told me that they were selling um, that that omelette, I called them, and said, you know what, free advice, just double the price of your omelette and you will sell more. So, and then what happened? Nothing happened. So they left their price at $1,000 for almost and 10 years. Now. Okay. Um, I wrote about this in my, in my first book, um, but, for me, but in this book basically I just describe it as the $1,000 omelette that could theoretically be sold at a much higher price. So then, t and then I forgot about the omelette. So almost 10 years later, I open the, the computer in the morning and then I see on CNBC that this omelette was all on the top pages of all the uh, of all the uh, newspapers, and everyone basically was saying, um, "Why was it on the top?" Because they said, "Well, we increased the price now to two thousand dollars," and everyone was saying, "How can an omelette be two thousand dollars?" Yeah, and so um, they were interviewing the um, in those uh, reports. They were interviewing the hotel, and they said, uh, "Since we increased the price, which they did just because some of the ingredients of this omelette are caviar, and the caviar prices went up." Um, so since they increased the price, they doubled the amount of om or they they uh, yeah, almost the uh, uh, doubled the amount of omelets that they sold, which actually shows that if your product is too cheap, you have kind of you're kind of off. Consumers will kind of understand that the value is not really matching. So no, it's not really about value and the price either. It's it's really about experience too, right? You really know, it's mentioned. always it's in in principle. Storytelling. In principle, I would say it all starts with value. Because if people would, and this may sound really absurd at, at the, if we take the $2,000 omelette, but if someone would think it's too expensive, they would never buy it. So this means the first thing is someone has to be able to create, let's say, at least a $2,000 value, so otherwise no one will pay $2,000 for the omelette. So it all starts with the value. So now the question is how do we create the value? And we create the value by two things, A, the experience, and B, um, next to the experience, there has to be a good story. Yeah? And um, so storytelling and luxury is extremely important. And talking about that, is there like a standard to differentiate you know, luxury and not so luxury brands at the beginning of marketing position? You know, I would say in the past, it was relatively easy. And in the past, I mean, sometimes maybe even 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Is it perspective from the consumers or from the manufacturers? Um, I would say from both. Right. So let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was relatively easy. Why? Because in most categories, there was a huge gap between a normal product and the luxury product. And very often, what was creating the gap? Maybe design, maybe uh, materials that were used. So let's say if you think about a car, finer leathers in, in the more expensive cars, they were larger, there was more size in the car. So there were a couple of factors that basically let people understand this is a difference to luxury between luxury and non-luxury. Right now those lines are very blurry. So if you buy now even a relatively cheap car, you can buy a leather seat and you can have a relatively nice interior. So in a first glance there's maybe not so much a difference anymore between let's say an entry-level car and a luxury car. There is some, but the delta is much, much uh, uh, narrower than it was in the, in the, uh, in the past. And uh, this makes, and that, this is number one. The second thing is now, we have so much more competition. Yeah, a couple of years ago, in almost all categories, there were very few brands. There were not, were not so many luxury car brands. There were not so much, many luxury fashion brands. Um, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, not so many handbags were there to buy. Right. Yeah, if you think now, many, much more brands, much more products, it's easier for a new brand to come into the market because you can just sell online. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to have stores. Stores will still help you, but um, if you just want to get quick into the market, you can just open a web store and then everyone can, can, can do see it. it. So you have much, much more um, uh, players. 
Um, and so now the combination of having more products, having much many more brands, so you have much more competition, and then the difference between the entry-level product and the luxury product as from a product perspective is not so big anymore. So this means um, luxury brands cannot rely anymore just on on um, basically the quality or materials or design because this will this is important but it's not the differentiator so now you have to combine all of those factors and you have to tell a fantastic story and if the story is not intriguing if the experience that is created is not very distinct different to any other experiences then basically everything everything will fall apart very cool that's a lot of information we mm. communicated yeah. and i would love to ask you i mean i have so many more questions mm. and i'm pretty sure our viewers want to ask you about <laughs> so can you please tell us your way you know what if they want to get in touch with you yeah. or if they want to learn more about your books yeah. and your lectures where can they find you yeah so um what you can do is so but my company's website or my company is on on a website called equitybrands.com and there on this website you find basically most of the information um, actually and this is maybe interesting also for everyone interested more in a uh, chinese view on luxury or an asian view on luxury so there's a publication called jing daily and on jing daily i write every monday about luxury so this is online it's free so anyone can go on jing daily and then every monday there's a column called future of luxury and there you will find kind of my thoughts about luxury that's awesome, Daniel. Mm. Thank you so much again for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. This was great. Thanks for watching this week's Shannon's Life is Style, and I'll see you next week, same time. Oh, don't forget to write to me about your thoughts for the show, or if there's a place you'd like to see in the town, or if you think your business is a real highlight of Vegas life and want it to be featured. We always do a lucky drawing among the viewers at the end of each episode and send out different surprises each week. No strings attached. So maybe you're the next lucky winner. Thanks for watching Shannon's Life of Style. Don't go away. We'll be right back.